And let's just pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, uh, again, this morning. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this collection of ancient documents, Lord, this miracle that we call a Bible. Father, we thank you for the words in these pages. We thank you that they have been preserved for thousands of years so that today we can dive in and we can have a look at what your word says, Father. We thank you, Lord, that your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, God. Jesus, you said that your words were spirit and they were life. And so, Father, I just pray this morning as we have a look at what your word says, I pray, God, would you speak to each person in this room in a language they would understand. Father, would you let them see what they need to see in your word today? Let them hear from the Holy Spirit what it is that they need to hear today, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen, amen, amen. Um, if you've got a, a collection of ancient documents that we call a Bible, if you've got one there, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2 very quickly. Hebrews chapter 2. In 1979, I want to just start with a story. In 1979, there was a plane, and it left New Zealand. It was, it was a, a passenger plane, 257 passengers on that plane, and it was doing a scenic tour. Anyone been to New Zealand before? Anyone seen Lord of the Rings? You've basically been to New Zealand. Um, but it was a scenic tour, 257 passengers on this flight, 1979. They were flying at a certain altitude, and at a certain point, the pilot was going to drop to a lower altitude where they could get a beautiful view of the scenery and the panorama of uh, New Zealand. Now, unfortunately, when that plane took off, it was off by two degrees on its flight pattern, only two degrees. It doesn't sound like a lot and doesn't seem like a lot, but it was two degrees off, and that two degrees caused it to go about 28 miles further east than the pilot thought that they were going. And as the pilot began to descend to give the passengers on the plane a great view of the scenery, instead he descended straight down into the side of Mount Erebus, a volcanic uh, mountain over there in New Zealand, killing uh, all 257 passengers on board of the plane. When I think about where the church started, Sometimes I think about my own journey with the Lord. I remember getting saved at 19. I'm 52 or going on 52 now. I remember when I got saved and I remember just diving into, just devouring the word of God. I remember I was at, I was at every time the door opened, the, the church doors were open, I was there. I just was hungry for God. When I would finish work, I would come home and I would open the window or wherever I was and I would sit and I would just, I would talk to God as if, Casper the Friendly Ghost was right there in the room with me. I actually just believed that everything I said, God was a part of. Everything I did, God was there. I just had this incredible, simple, childlike, I guess, faith. But at the same time, a very exciting faith. And I, I, I felt like I, I, was, I, I could hear the voice of God. I felt like I could sense the Holy Spirit and so on. And sometimes when I think about that beginning stages of my journey with God, and I fast forward to today, sometimes I think, God, I wonder somewhere along the line, have I gone one maybe two degrees off the flight path? Am, am I still on that same journey, God? Or, or sometimes I feel like I'm just a little bit, maybe I'm not quite on that same path and things are a little bit different. And maybe there are areas where I'm slightly off kilter or slightly off track. I, I read the, uh, the first 30 years of the history of the church in the book of Acts and, and I see the, the, the power of God. I see the preaching of the gospel. I read in uh, uh, Acts chapter uh, 9, I think it is, just, uh, or Acts chapter 8, just after the stoning of Stephen. And it says that Saul started this massive persecution against the believers in Jesus. And it says that they all scattered, except the apostles. It says that the, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. So they didn't go, they stayed. But it says that the general population, they scattered everywhere. But it says this, it says they went everywhere preaching Jesus. In other words... The message of Jesus and the reality of Jesus has just cost them their life. It's just cost them their life. This, they're set up in Jerusalem, they're living there, and all of a sudden this massive persecution. There would have been people with businesses and, and maybe had their kids wait on the wait list for someone in Christian college and, you know, or whatever it was. Or, or people in sporting teams or established relationships and fields and farms and so on. And because of Jesus and the persecution, bang, they had to take off. But instead of moving to the next town and when their children started to have a conversation with a, a child in the next village and started to say, yeah, we were, we're followers of Jesus, instead of going, shh, shh be quiet, don't say nothing, because look what that cost us before. It says they went everywhere and they preached Jesus. Isn't that amazing? What, what a powerful church. What a, what, I, I think about the revelation they must have had, the commitment they had, the passion they had. To just forge on, no matter what the consequences were, no matter what was going on around them, no matter what society was saying, no matter where culture was heading, they forged on with an unflinching, unchanging message of the goodness of God. And they didn't mind whatever it cost. 
whatever it costs. It's, it's like there was no life preservation. It's almost as if they believed that this life down here is a drop in the bucket and it's not all about this because one day we will be in heaven. One day we'll be with God. One day we'll be in eternity. And what really matters down here is not a focus on maintaining and keeping what we got down here, but making sure we maintain and keep what we got up there. That we get there. What did Jesus say? He said, don't store up treasures on this earth where moth and rust destroy. But he said, store up treasures in heaven. And it's almost as if this group of early believers had a vision that went way beyond this natural see, taste, touch, feel, smell, earth. It went way beyond this planet that we live on, way beyond the now. And they saw something in the future. And when their eyes were fixed on that, man, they just charged on and it didn't matter so much what went on down here. I don't think they wanted to be persecuted. I don't think they wanted to be beaten. I don't think they wanted to be stoned. I don't think they wanted to go to prison. But I think they'd made the decision that none of that was going to change the course that they'd set for their life. And sometimes I look at that and then I look at the church today. Um, we, we, we've had the privilege of, of living in India for a number of years and then being back in Australia and pastoring with different groups and so on. And sometimes I look at the church today and I go, God, somewhere have we gotten one or two degrees off? Because one or two degrees off doesn't seem like a lot when you first start your journey, does it? It just doesn't seem like a lot when you first start walking. If I'm going to walk straight at that, that TV screen and I'm just slightly like this, like that, that doesn't, it doesn't look like a great distance off. It doesn't look like it's a massive consequence. But if I keep going, the further and the further and the further I go, before you know it, I'm landing in a place and I'm going, wow, I was meant to be 28 miles east over there and now I'm over here and guess what? I'm running into all sorts of problems. Why? Not because the destination, originally the destination or the place I wanted to go to is bad or wrong, but because I got off track somewhere along the way. I got off track somewhere along the way. See, I believe when we give our lives to Jesus that his work this, the, 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 this collection of ancient documents, these writings written over 1,600 years from prisons, from caves, from palaces. These words that have been preserved throughout history, I believe by God, I believe by the Holy Spirit. These words become our coordinates for life. This is the path, this is the direction that we set our face towards. This is our compass, our true north. And if we get away from it, maybe one, maybe two degrees, and we're comfortable with that, and we allow that to happen, it's no wonder so many people end up in a place where one day they turn around and they go, where is God? I don't even know if I believe in God anymore. I, I, I don't feel like I experience the presence of God. I don't feel like there's, there's anything, I don't even pray anymore, because what's the point? I never... And I reckon if you trace a lot of this stuff back, you would go, okay, I wonder when, was there a point where you just stopped prioritizing time in God's word? Is there a time where you, you kind of got off center and instead of taking your cues on what God thinks about things or how God feels about things or how God sees things, instead of turning to, to these documents that the Holy Spirit has preserved for thousands of years for us, instead of turning to that, you turn to culture or you turn to popular opinion or you turn to Facebook or Mr. Google or Twitter or TikTok, tock, 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 tock. <laughs> and we wonder why we get ourselves slightly off kilter. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, here's what the writer of, 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 of to, to this, this, this group of believers who came out of an, uh, an Old Testament style ritual, the Jewish rituals and all that, they come out of that background, found liberty and faith and freedom in Jesus. But because of external situations, because of external pressures and influences, these guys were tempted to go back to their old way of life. That's the background of this writing. That's why you find so often in Hebrews, uh, the old way was this, but Jesus is this. The, the temple was this, Jesus is this. The old types of sacrifices were this, but Jesus is this. There's a comparison throughout there because he's trying to say all that stuff was, was, was just the shadow of things to come. Jesus is the things to come. And so stick with Jesus. Don't go back to all that ritualism and legalism. Stick with Jesus. And in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, he says this. He says, we must pay the more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard. In other words, they had heard a message. They had heard something. 
There are people out there now writing books and trying to say to the church in 2024 that the early church had no orthodox set of teachings. It was all kind of made up on the spot. So if today we can tweak and change and whatever we want, we can make up whatever works for us today. Because there was no set. Oh, I'm telling you, that is such a lie. And, and you'll see it as you go back and you read these letters, these references to, you've already heard a message, stick with it. You've heard a body of teaching, stick with it. Don't be pulled this way and don't be pulled that way. And he says, you've got to pay the most careful attention. That word literally means more abundant, a, a greater degree, a more earnest and above everything else type of attention. Our attention has to be there more than anything else. He says, if you don't pay careful attention and you don't keep yourself fixed, on God's logical and loving limitations for life, or God's word, or call it God's law, or I don't care what you want to call it, but if you don't stick within the tracks of God and the way that he designed us to live and to thrive down here on planet Earth with this incredible gift called life that he gave to us, if we don't stick within those rails, he says, here's what's going to happen. You will drift away. You will drift away. If you don't want to drift away, that's what he's saying. If you don't want to drift away, come back and pay attention to what you heard. Because when you drift from what you heard, you drift away. You drift away. The church today is in a very, very similar predicament. Do we stand on the truth as God sees it? Or do we compromise our faith? Or in some cases, abandon it altogether because of potential persecution or external pressures? It's a very serious question and a very real question that the church is faced with in the West today. Do we stand on the truth as God sees it? Or do we compromise our faith because of potential persecution or external pressure? See, Paul says that the first step in not drifting away, pay careful attention to what you have heard. Come back to what you have heard. The truth of who Jesus is. The truth of what he did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. We remembered it. We celebrated it last weekend. And then you got... And I don't mean to speak ill of an authority figure. I don't believe in doing that. But Joe Biden stands up and declares last weekend National Day of Transvisibility on the most holy day that the church has. The apparent leader of the supposed most impressive and important and strong and influential nation on the world, and I say that in quotes, stands up and says that this is now Transvisibility Day. And I thought, how far is the world going from, from Jesus? How far are we drifting from our Judeo-Christian worldview? That you would dare stand, even to feel that that was okay to stand up publicly and to say that. A man of that authority, I thought, oh, Lord Jesus, what is going on? What is going on? If we don't pay careful attention to God's word, then our human default is to slowly drift away to whatever's popular. If we don't pay attention to what God says about things in culture and society, then our natural default will be to drift to whatever feels right. Isn't it? We'll start just, well, yeah, but this feels right. Yeah, well, I don't care if it feels right. Does it line up with God's word? There's a lot of things that feel right that don't line up with God's word. Right? But if we don't have our mind set on that, if we're not fixing ourselves on what God has to say and getting into his word and seeing what he has to say, then we will drift to whatever feels right. Or we'll drift to whatever intellectual argument seems to stimulate us the most. And before you know it, you start drifting. You start drifting. Billy Graham said this, and I thought it was very, very prophetic. Billy Graham once said this, thousands of of uninstructed Christians. And by the way, I don't think Billy Graham meant uninstructed as in we're silly. What he meant was we don't want to spend time in the word of God anymore to find our true north. It's like the Berean in Acts what is it, 16, 17, where Paul goes to Thessalonica and you know, they, they hear what he has to say and gobble it up and then he goes to Berea and it says the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians in this, that they heard the words of Paul, they were keen to hear what this great apostle had to say, but they checked the scriptures daily to make sure what he said was true. Even Paul the apostle, they said, we don't care who you are, we don't care if you're the greatest, most popular preacher on planet Earth right now. We're going to go back to these ancient documents and we're just going to make sure because that's our true north, not the most popular teaching of the church today, not what's trendy today, not what feels good, not what sounds really smart. We're going back and making sure and checking so we don't drift away. Amen? We don't want to drift away. We can't afford to drift away. Billy Graham said this, thousands of uninstructed Christians are being deceived today. False teachers use high-sounding words that seem like the height of logic, scholarship, and culture. They are intellectually clever in their sophistry, in their ability to speak, and adept at beguiling thoughtless, untaught men and women. What's he talking about? He's saying so many people in the church are drifting away. 
You're drifting away because there's some really clever people out there. But you're not coming back to say, yeah, but does it, does it line up with this? Does it line up with this? Does it line up with the character and nature of God as revealed in the very words of God? Does it line up with that? See, I believe this. We're in a very significant cultural moment as a church in the West. And if the church can stand firm on what it believes to be true about itself, if we can stand firm on what we believe to be true about the world and what we believe to be true about God, then we're going to come into a season of tremendous opportunity for the gospel. Tremendous opportunity. But only if we don't drift. How many, how, many of you, how many of you sometimes, it's probably harder for the younger generation because you're growing up as this is happening, but, but, but sort of older generation, do you ever sometimes hear a statement that's... I, I, I watched a girl the other day. This is a woman. Now, now we have... Jesus was the, one of the greatest advocates of women's rights. If you understand the culture of the Gospels and you understand the culture of, of, of when Jesus came and you see the things that he did and his interactions with women and you understand the platform that he gave to women, he, 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 was, a, he, he was a trailblazer. And, and, and then you, you move through the ages and we fought for the rights of women and so on. And then I watch things like men now competing in female sports. And I'm scratching my head going, we're so smart that we knew we needed to kind of balance out the ledger and fight for women's rights and then we got so smart that we got so dumb that we moved past that to a place called ludicrousy and we can't see don't you realize you're undoing everything that you fight for men are winning we're saying to our young girls i've got a daughter and, and, and i'm reading this stuff going man i'm encouraging my daughter be the best train you got to work hard to be the best and then some guy, just because of, 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 of the, not that men are not better than women, but biologically we are different. And so some guy that's coming 63rd in his male track event decides to become a woman and goes across and wins the gold medal at the college event. I'm thinking, dude, go back. You're the 63rd fastest man. Deal with it. But we allow that and we put it on a pedestal and we cheer it on. Yay, the great. Meanwhile, women's rights are going backwards, and we're so smart we can't see it. It's ludicrous. I watched a young girl uh, being interviewed on a radio station a, a couple of weeks ago, and she, and have you heard of a furry? There's a new one for me. She's a furry. A furry means that you no longer, uh, uh, you're not male or female. She said, I'm a furry, I'm a dog. And I'm thinking, if I was your dad... You're not a dog. You're a beautiful woman made in the very image of God. And she's saying this. She's going, you know, I, I, I'm a dog and I wear a collar. And she said, my favourite time of the day is when my boyfriend gets home from work. He puts a chain on and takes me for a walk. And I'm going, this can't be real. But she's sitting there. Yeah, it is. For her, it's real. For her, it's real. It's ludicrous. I'm sorry, but it's just ludicrous. You are a beautiful woman made in the image of God. You're not a fairy. There are some things that are right. There are some things that are wrong. You know, you know Proverbs 29. Here's a, there's a passage in Proverbs 29. We, we, we consider ourselves a Pentecostal church. And I know some people come in and they say, you're not Pentecostal enough. I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? I don't know. Because we're not hanging upside down from there, praying in tongues. Does that mean we're not Pentecostal? I don't get it. Anyway, we are who we are. We love Jesus. We believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. And I care about all the tags. But here's the thing. Um... Happens to me sometimes. I lose my train of thought. What was I saying? Psalm 29. Psalm 29, that's right. You know, most of the time when you go to church and we preach, we preach out of like the you know, New King James Version or the NIV. We kind of get away from the Old King James. Except for this one verse. For some reason, we throw this one verse. Psalm 29, I think it's 18 somewhere there. Proverbs 29. Eh? And it says that, that without a vision, people perish. Anyone ever heard that one preached before? Yeah. 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 Without a vision, people perish. And that's usually what we will use to, you know. I go to pastor's meetings and we get, without a vision, people perish. In other words, you've got to come up with a vision and you've got... Bottom line, here's the thing. If Jesus Christ crucified, hanging on a cross, dying for your sins is not a compelling enough vision for you, I can't top that. If Jesus Christ saying, go into all the world and preach the gospel, is not a compelling enough vision for you, I'm not even going to bother trying to top that. If Jesus Christ crucified, buried and resurrected is not a compelling enough vision for you to wake up each day and say, I'm going to live for him, I can't top that. So I'm not going to waste my time trying. Right? But here's the thing, that verse means nothing about a church or an organisation having a vision. Go and read the context. Read the context. What it actually means is this. It says that where there is no revelation, in other words, no revealed word of God, it says that people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who keeps the law. 
It's not talking about corporations or organisations at all. It's talking about an individual's response to the word of God. It says when there's no revelation, in other words, when we stop preaching the gospel, when people stop hearing the good news, when they stop hearing about God, when they, stop, when they get away from the word of God, what happens is people then, if they don't have any guardrails, they cast it off and they make up their own guardrails. And all of a sudden, guess what? Everyone's got their own truth. That's your truth. That's your truth. And we love it. We're happy because it's a loving thing to do. You can have your truth and you have your truth. And I agree with that. Until all of a sudden your truth crosses my truth, you know? I mean, my, my, my truth is that, my truth is, Mick, that, that I, 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 I can take the keys of your car and take it whenever I want. So after, we're going on holidays next week. I'm taking your car. That's my truth. You can't. You've got to be happy with it, Mick. You know? Probably wouldn't. He's such a lovely guy. Probably go, okay, here you go. <laughs> when there's no revelation, no word of God, we cast off restraint. We make our own guardrails. We make up our own rules. And you know what? I think that's a great picture of what's going on in the world today. It's a great picture of what's going on in the world today. We're just making up our own stuff as we go along. And, and here's, here's what I think. If the, church, if the church can stand firm, if we can stand firm in our faith, if we can stand firm in what we believe, and I, I honestly don't mean to offend anybody, but we've been doing a series, Romans chapter 12. We're talking about renewing the mind. We're talking about renewing the mind. Okay? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Now, here's the thing. Transformed by the renewing of the mind takes effort. You've got to get into God's word. You've got to know what God has to say about things. That's how you are transformed. Transformation takes effort. Conforming to the pattern of this world takes no effort because you are marinating in a culture as we speak. You are just marinating in this culture. You are hearing it in the music. You are seeing it on TV. You are, you are reading it in the papers. You are coming across it in conversation. You are marinating in a culture. Being conformed takes no effort at all. Being transformed takes some effort on our part. And the further we drift from the word of God, the less important the word of God is to us than the less we understand the guardrails of God. And if we are not actively transforming by the renewing of our mind, we are being, by default, conforming slowly, bit by bit, to the pattern of this world. It might start as one degree, maybe two degrees, and then one day you're running smack bang into a mountain and you're wondering why. It's because we're allowing ourselves to drift. But if the church can stand firm in this season, here's what's going to happen. I honestly believe the ludicrousness of the world is going to catch up with itself at some point. It's going to catch up at some point. Someday, they're going to reach a point where eventually they'll get to a boundary where people will start to, a bit like the Emperor's New Clothes. You know that story, the Emperor's New Clothes? Anyone know that story, childhood story? Emperor comes to town, right? And, 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 and sorry, these, these, these seamstress guys, what do you call them? Seamstress guys, what's the word? Tailors, tailors, that's it. These tailors come to town and they say that they can make the most amazing suit for the king. But here's the thing, the suit is so amazing that only the most intelligent people can see it. And so day after day, they, they, the king gives them this room and says, make me one. They're in the room and they're sewing and the king pops his head in and he can't see nothing. He just sees these hands doing this, right? But you're not going to say that because only the most intelligent can see how beautiful that garment is, that suit of clothing is. So they're there for days, doom, 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 doom. And then they bring in the king and they say, we're done. The king comes in and they just do this. And the king, you can just imagine the scene. He's standing there stark naked. And they put this thing over him. But they're so convincing. They go, oh, man, you look amazing. That's awesome. What do you think? And the king stands there and goes, wow. This is amazing. I've never seen such handiwork. Huh? Well, then the next day, they make this big announcement. The king's going to be on his chariot and he's going to go through town and everyone's going to see him. We're all going to clap and cheer the king. Well, nobody wants to admit to being an idiot. So the king gets in his chariot, stark naked, going through. I can imagine he's standing up doing these ones to his, you know. And all of a sudden, this little boy puts his hand up and goes, he's naked. And he said it in a British accent like that. He's naked. Or a French accent. Yeah, he's a naked. Indian, oh, oh, he's naked. (laughs) And all of a sudden, everybody started to laugh. All it took was one boy. One boy that stood his ground and went, he's got nothing on. This is stupid. And all of a sudden, the crowds began to laugh and realised, hey, you've been had. And I think that's what's going to happen eventually. That's what I believe. But the question is this. Are the church going to be the ones that will stand their ground and not join in the party and then have somebody else go, he's naked, and we go, oh, yeah, we always thought that. Or are we going to be the ones that stand firm and go, not believe in that?
It's not true. And you can go on your journey and you're going to loop around, you're going to come back. And when you do and you realise the rest of the world has lied to you, are they going to look at the church and go, but you know, we can trust them. They never, they never budged on this. They stood firm from day one. We can trust these guys. Where are you getting this from? The word of God, we can trust that. Is that going to be our testimony or is it not going to be our testimony? See, our minds are being transformed on purpose by God's word, causing us to lean more into God, or they're being conformed by default as we marinate daily in current culture. We, our, our service has gone a little bit longer today than normal because we had more announcements than normal. I apologize for that, but I just want to finish with this because we've been doing this series on renewing the mind. A couple of weeks' time, we're going to take a bit of a sharper turn. We've been looking at uh, uh, the, the lies that, that live in our mind, the, the way we see ourselves and God and so on. I want to take a bit of a turn now. And I want to go external. I want to start looking at some things in culture. We're going to dive into the Word of God and we're going, okay, let's have a look at what does the Word of God say about some of these cultural things that we're dealing with and battling with right now. Because we need to know. We need to know because here's what I'm afraid of. We've got a younger generation of kids growing up in the church. And I know that they're being told and hearing things outside the walls of the church. And if the church doesn't start to talk about some of this stuff, what hope have they got? If they're not hearing another side to the argument, they're going to grow up thinking, that's, all of a sudden, that's true. Now you guys have to prove otherwise. Science has shown the first thing you hear about a subject or a point, the first bit of information you gather about something becomes your default truth. And everything then is to try to convince you otherwise. That's the way it works. That's neuroscience. You lock it in. The first thing you hear, that's the default truth. And everything from then has to fight against that and prove away. Well, what do we think is going to happen to these young kids if we don't talk about some of these things? And we can't talk about this stuff if we ourselves don't actually know what the Word of God says because we're listening to popular culture or we don't want to be hurtful or we don't want to offend. It's about time that we lifted our voices a little bit. Not in anger, not in protest, but we stood firm in love because we love the world. And I don't want to see the world go to hell in the handbasket. Amen? I want to see people come to the reality of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 3, I'll just... I want to sort of finish with a couple of verses here. Deception has always been a problem for the church. It's always been a problem for the church. Right back from, from the, the, the time these ancient writers wrote, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 3, Paul says to the Corinthians, I hope you'll put up with, with a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. And verse 3 says, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, the devil deceived her. How did he do it? He led her mind astray. Your minds may somehow be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That's the battlefield, and that's what the world's going after, and that's what the devil's going after. Go back to Genesis. What did the devil go after straight away? Did God say that? Really? Oh, he plants a seed. Gets us thinking differently. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul was warning the church about deception. Galatians 5, 7 to 9. He says to the Galatians, you were running a good race. Don't lose that word, were. In other words... You were running a really good race. Something's happened. Something's happened on the way here, people. And this is very early in the life of the Christian church. You were running a great race. I wonder how many of us in this room right now would have that same testimony. We were running a good race at one point. But maybe we've gotten caught up in some of the, the world's stuff. Maybe we've gotten caught up in the intellectual garble out there. Maybe we've gotten caught up in the emotional drive of things. Maybe we've gotten caught up in things that have caused us to drift away from the word of God. Maybe, I'm, I don't know, I'm just saying maybe. And maybe corporately as a church in the West, maybe, maybe we're drifting a little bit. I think we are, especially when I see uh, the whole denominations now, having rainbow days and all this sort of stuff. And I'm not anti any people. Please hear me, I'm not anti any people. But God designed this world and he knows the best way to get the most out of it, Amen. He says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? He says, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. And then he says this, a little yeast works through the whole bunch of dough. Little yeast. When we lived in India, I remember very vividly one day, I used to just eat anything anywhere. I had a cast iron stomach from a bad upbringing. And I remember one night we went to get an omelette on the side of the road. We're driving along and I said to Jackie, I'm really hungry. I'm going to just stop that guy. He's got a motorbike with a little fire thing and he's cooking eggs. I'm going to get an omelette. And I went and got that omelette. And you know what? I watched him crack that egg and I watched him chuck it on that thing. I watched him cook it up. I'm telling you right now, I can guarantee that egg was 99% good egg. But there was 1% of something in there that wasn't. <laughs> and I spent the next four days with liquids coming out of body parts that didn't know existed. It was terrible. It was terrible. Four days, I was down and out. I thought I was going to die. Hey, but it was 98% good egg. 
can't whinge about that, can you? That's pretty good. But it's amazing how powerful that 1% can be. It's amazing how powerful that 1% can be if it goes undealt with and unnoticed. Remember, one degree. One degree. If you're starting here and you're one degree, you might not feel it now, you might not experience it now, you might not think it's a problem right now. But one day, one day that one degree can catch up with you. 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Notice it says what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. How many of you know there's what you want to hear, but there's what you need to hear? Amen? There's a lot of stuff I want to hear from God, but there's stuff I need to hear from God. And the stuff I need to hear brings life to me. Stuff I want is going to cause me to drift. I need to be open to what God wants me to hear. Got what I need to hear. It says they'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Romans 16, 17, 18, I urge you, brothers and sisters, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive where? The minds. They deceive the minds of naive people. It's amazing the damage one degree off center can cause over the course of a journey. I'm going to leave it at that because we want to get to this barbecue. And next few weeks, we're going to have a couple of weeks. We've got a couple of different speakers for the next couple of weeks. But uh, we've got uh, Jim White going to be preaching here for us next Sunday. And then the Sunday after that, we've got Smithy. Everyone know big Smithy up here, worship? Smith's going to be preaching for us too. So, um, But after that, I want to dive into this whole, let's have a bit of a look at what the Word of God says because maybe there might be some people here and I'm not having to go at anybody, but maybe some of us have got caught up in the emotion of the culture. We get caught up in the intellectual arguments of culture, and we've drifted from what the Word of God has to say about up, down, left, right, right, wrong. What's the best and what's the worst? What's acceptable and what's really not? What's God's highest? And what's a second-rate substitute? So we're going to dive into the Word of God, and we're going to look at some of these things in the coming weeks. Can we just close our eyes for a second? Just close your eyes. Bow your head. I don't know everybody that's here this morning, but I do know this. I do know that you're not here by accident. I do know that God loves you. I do know that you are not an accident. I do know that Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins so that one day when you face God, you will not have to. I do know that. And I'm going to ask you a very simple question this morning. If you want to respond to that, I just want you to put your hand in the air. The question is this. Are you at a place where you're willing to step out in faith and trust? the reality of God and the sacrifice of Jesus for your future. I was 19 years of age, with no church background, no Bible in the house, none of that stuff, and I had to make the decision one day, God, I think you're there. I think you're there. I can't prove it all. I can't work it all out. I don't understand it all, but I, there's something inside of me that says, God, I think you're real. And I made a decision when I was 19 to start following Jesus, and he filled my heart with hope. He gave my life purpose and changed me. If that's you this morning, you'd like to say, yes, I, I want to follow Jesus Christ. I want to make that decision today. I'm going to ask it once. I'm not going to bring you up the front. It's between you and God. It's just an act of faith towards God. So I want you to throw your hand in the air. Just throw your hand in the air and let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's all stand together and pray together. Thank you, Lord. Just pray, just pray with me. We had a hand go up there. So we're all going to pray together. Everyone knows what happens when somebody gives their life to Jesus. There's a party in heaven, so we're going to have a party around a barbecue. But uh, let's all pray together. Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your death, burial, and resurrection. Thank you that you died for me so that I don't have to. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. And right now today, I make the decision, the choice, to start following after you. Forgive me for my sins and empower me by your spirit to live the life that you created me for. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And in-